Um, lovely to be here. Uh, my colleague Rebecca Filan is here in the front row as well, so she might jump in and uh, correct me or uh, make some uh, additional comments if I say anything uh, which I shouldn't be saying. Um, I'm going to tell you um, a bit about the overall project that we have, and then we'll look into some, um, some specific details as well. So we are a group of marine biologists, mainly conservation. Corey Bradshaw is a conservation biologist who's a big data cruncher. And uh, Rebecca, as well as being an environmental scientist, is also a school teacher. So we've got the whole gambit of uh, interest here. Yeah. So Saving Nemo is the name of our program. Um, this is the website. I'll just quickly go on to the website and hopefully it'll pop up. Um, just to give you an idea of all the different uh, areas that we are involved with. Um, so we talk a bit about the, the whole idea of why we're working on clownfish, the different type of work that we're doing, a variety of ways to get involved, some campaigns that we're working on, as well as our citizen science project. And um, we also have educational projects as well. So it's really research, education, outreach, and breeding is one of our big, um, uh, big projects to sort of help with the problems we've identified, and I'll tell you a bit more detail about that. Okay, so um, it's a, it's a university-based group at the moment, and we're moving towards not-for-profit status. So that's kind of the position that we're in. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but clownfish are the number one species that are sold as part of the marine aquarium trade. Within the aquarium trade, approximately 95% of freshwater fish are bred in captivity, which is quite different from the marine, um, the marine area, where less than maybe 6-5% of fish are bred in captivity. All the rest of them are taken from the wild. Most places within Australia do have um, quite strict limits in terms of the number of collectors they allow, as well as the number of uh, fish that you're allowed to collect. Um, however, the actual what fish you're taking, um, whether it be the adults, the juveniles, etc., that's not really looked at um, so carefully. Um, you can't collect, of course, in marine park zones that are highly protected, but in other areas, they're just open and up for grabs. Um, the industry itself is worth a lot of money, well over $300 million a year. Um, and in Australia, as I said, we've got quite tight controls, but around the rest of the world, the controls are pretty lax. And in fact, in places like the Philippines, for example, um, you can collect as many fish as you want from wherever you want, including in the marine parks, which is um, quite problematic. Um, Overcollecting in some of these um, Southeast Asian countries has um, resulted in local extinctions of populations of clownfish. And not only are, we, are they removing the clownfish and the anemones, but they're using cyanide poisoning in order to collect them, and that's killing the coral. So all the, the main reefs around the Philippines at the moment are uh, essentially in really terrible uh, condition. Um, at the moment, Australia is importing fish from these areas. In fact, almost 100% of the fish that we are selling on the market right now have been imported from countries other than Australia. So the collecting we do here is very minimal most of what we're getting in is coming from overseas. So we're kind of contributing or allowing what is happening to happen over there. Where did this love affair with clownfish originate? Any ideas? Oh, does anybody recognize these characters? So since the uh, film was released, the number of clownfish uh, pets in captivity has increased astronomically. So the number of fish being taken from the wild has done a similar increase. There has been an initiative to start breeding them in captivity. So the number that have been taken from the wild has now started to decrease slightly. But the vast majority of fish that are sold are still wild, um, wild caught. 
And, okay, I already mentioned that. So the problem with over-harvesting um, our multiple, A, we don't want species to go into local extinctions, but when you remove fish, the anemone is quite susceptible to predation. So if you're taking all the fish from the anemone, then the anemone will die, and then fewer anemones around, meaning fewer fish, et cetera. It's all a bad um, situation once you allow excessive collecting going on. The other thing is these fish are protandrous hermaphrodites, which means that they're all born as males. So all of the little fish that you see within the anemone have all settled from outside. They're not the babies of the parents that live there. They're juvenile males that have settled from nearby reefs. Um, those babies start waiting in the queue, essentially. And as the one bigger than them dies, it gets knocked out, they can move up one spot in line. So they keep moving up, keep moving up. There can be up to 10 fish within a single anemone. When you get to be the second largest fish, you become the breeding male. So you'll turn from a juvenile male into a sexually mature male. And if you're really lucky, the biggest fish in your anemone will die, and you will get to change sex and become the female. And so this situation is quite complex in terms of its biology. And if we just go in and take the two largest breeding individuals, it can take more than a year for the next individuals to go through that physiological change and become the breeding individuals. Changing from a male to a female is a bit of hard work, apparently. <laughs> um, of course, adding to the collection threats are the threats of um, bleaching. So anemones bleach in exactly the same way that corals bleach. They have the same photosynthetic algae that lives within them. The problem is when anemones bleach, they don't necessarily um, pick up a virus or bacteria such as corals do. So the main reason that corals die when they bleach is they get infected by the, a virus or bacteria, and that's what kills them. But uh, the anemones don't necessarily get these viruses, so they can last quite a while in a bleach form. And in fact, we've done some bleaching experiments in the lab where we, we've had them bleach for over a year. But what they need is to have fish within them because this symbiotic relationship is very important and the fish contribute species which has nitrogen in it that the algae use in order to proliferate. So you remove the fish from a bleached or an unbleached anemone, that anemone will be either preyed upon or if it's bleached it won't have the same resources it needs to come back to life. So what are we doing about that? <clears throat> We've got a few different areas, as I said. Research, awareness campaigns. Big thing that we're focusing on, on at the moment is something we're calling aquaculture conservation, or basically captive breeding. Um, we have both school-based projects as well as community citizen science projects, and I'm going to tell you a bit about them now. I uh, probably won't mention that. <clears throat> We've had a big campaign called Fish Kiss for Nemo. And we were getting people to upload a photograph of themselves doing, you know, the fish kiss. And then tagging not only Saving Nemo, but also tagging Ellen DeGeneres. And we were really hoping to get Ellen involved in this campaign. And do you remember last year Ellen came up and said, we need to focus on the Great Barrier Reef? Remember her making that big statement? She didn't say it was because of us, but we gave a lot of pressure to her, and she followed this. So, I don't know, who knows, but we felt quite happy in the end that she did come out and make a pretty big statement about it. <coughs> um, we rely and do a lot of social media, so we're on Facebook, Instagram. We were on Twitter, but, you know, I'm not really great at maintaining all of those different sites. And the person that I had working on Twitter has gone on to bigger and better things. So we are trying to maintain all these sites, and I must admit that it's really hard to man maintain a big social media presence. And trying to get volunteers to do it, mm, it's again not really as good as what we'd like. In order to maintain that presence, you need something on social media every day. So I think that's been something that we've learned about the social media campaign. You've got to keep on it in a big way. We got a lot of media coverage when the new film, um, Finding Dory, was released. 
And so <clears throat> we must have got picked up by over 2,000 newspapers and radio stations. So a lot of interest, and at that time we were you know, really promoting and working on social media. But then other times, you know, it kind of falls down and our likes decrease. And so it's how do you keep maintaining that interest is a big question. Um, I've also done a lot of sort of public engagement things. This is uh, Leilani Munta. She's a big race car driver who's also a vegan and kind of a bit of a weird story there. But she came to Adelaide and wanted to um, help us raise awareness of this campaign as well, which was quite fun. Um, so captive breeding. We didn't start to do this um, because we thought it was a good idea. The fish we had in the lab just started breeding, and it wasn't part of the question that we were interested in. And we're kind of like, what are we going to do with all these baby fish? Um, and then it really started triggering that this could be a way for us to help solve the problem. And so we're working toward this idea of sort of eco-branding captive bred fish. Because we did a big survey of people when they went in to buy the fish. And we asked, do you know where your fish has come from? And they didn't realize that these fish were being taken from the wild. We then asked, would you pay more for a fish if it was captive bred versus wild caught? And the vast majority of people said they would actually pay more money knowing that it was captive bred. So this has sort of led us to the idea we've got to start cranking out captive bred fish. Now, clownfish are not all looking like Nemo. In fact, there are 28 different and so um, this one is still by far the most popular in terms of the aquarium trade. Um, they do make lovely pets. The thing with the captive bred individuals is that when you ship them from your captive breeding tank up to the shop, they don't die. Zero mortality. You bring a fish in from the wild, even capturing it all, already has a high mortality rate. Shipping it bring a fish home, your child falls in love with it, and then it dies in a couple of days, it's not a big thing. So captive bred fish are much, much happier and healthier in a tank. <coughs> um, we've also moved on to trying to establish some um, breeding programs within schools, and there are a couple of schools up in Queensland that are already doing it. We're kind of bringing them together to be part of the Saving Nemo program. I've now made links with the distributors in Australia, and so we're starting to get a feel for how many fish we need per month. They say we need something like 500 fish per month for the market, so we're talking about large numbers, which we can't put together at the moment. We have lots of education programs within our schools. We go out to little kindies, university students involved. I've just been told three minutes, so here I go. <laughs> We won a couple of National Science Week events that we've really engaged people in. And we've taken up international opportunities where we've set up a breeding program in the Maldives with different Maldivian clownfish. And they've just had babies as of yesterday. So we're very excited to help them with that program. Um, we really wanted to get some feedback. And perhaps some of you who are engaged in educational programs can help us with that afterwards. So please come and chat after this session. Um, this is our citizen science program. This one is specifically aimed at the fish, uh, clownfish on the Great Barrier Reef. And you can check that out on our website as well. Um, this is our app that we've developed. It's called I See Anemone. And as you can find Nemo within the anemone. Oh, <laughs> very cute, isn't it? <laughs> Um, we think we need to make some improvements on this to make sure that it's more user friendly, but we're starting to get um, fish and anemone photos and, and uploads from around the world or around the Indo-Pacific essentially. We're also targeting resorts to get um, specific snorkeling trails where you can um, get micro level differences between anemones and fish, see what the anemones are doing on a more um, regular basis, how many fish are maybe coming into that anemone. You guys already know a lot about this, perhaps. <laughs> but really, fi finally, what we want to do is to try and change policy at the government level 
we don't think we should be importing wild caught fish from Southeast Asia in particular. So we want to start really mounting this, this new campaign, which is about keeping wild fish free. Thank you very much. And we have some merchandise you can come and check out later. <laughs>